This week, recognizing faces years later, video from all angles, and the rise of the machines. Artificial intelligence continues to play a bigger and bigger role in our lives. So it's no surprise that the Barbican's summer exhibition charts our perception of computers, intelligence and artificial beings through the ages and through the lens of different cultures. The desire to create artificial life is old, very old. It goes back at least as far as the legend of the golem created from dust or clay and brought to life through incantation. AI, more than human, is a celebration and a critical examination of innovation. That's a lot of Asians. Showcasing the works of diverse digital artists and academic institutions around the world. See, in a hundred years time, we'll all look like this. How computers perceive us using cameras is an overarching theme here. Last week, we covered the UK police's increasing deployment of live facial recognition, from specially equipped vans to CCTV cameras. And in London, we caught an incident when one man refused to be scanned. I'm not cover my face, I cover my face. Don't push me over when I'm walking down the street. This man didn't want to be caught by the police cameras, so he covered his face police stopped him, they photographed him anyway, an argument followed. The police said this was disorderly behaviour, so they gave him a fine. If I'm going to cover my face, I'll cover my face. It's not for them to tell me not to cover my face. Mm. I've got a now £90 fine. There you go, look at that. Thanks lads, £90. Well done. And just this week, San Francisco has banned law enforcement agencies from using facial recognition. It's a landmark decision in the security versus civil liberties debate surrounding this technology. Well, we asked for your feedback and we were inundated with comments and questions. Many of you were of the opinion that if you've got nothing to hide, then there's nothing to worry about. And this is another tool to help keep us safe. But some opinions express exactly the opposite, that this is another step on the way to a surveillance state. Well, we've asked biometrics expert Stephanie Hare to answer some of your most prominent questions. Stephanie, welcome. Uh, one of the questions that was asked the most was whether facial recognition could work with people who choose to wear face coverings. And in fact, we put this to the police. Here's what they said. I also wondered about um, uh, face veils. Obviously, some, for some religious communities, they veil the face. Yes. Presumably that's a that's a problem, isn't it? That you're not going to get any result of that. Uh, it's not a problem. It's, it's more of a challenge. I think um, the way the technology works, we need to. The starting point is the eyes. The eyes are really important in terms of facial recognition technology. Uh, often those eyes are uh, visible uh, with face coverings to include motorcycle helmets. So the technology does work with motorcycle helmets as well. I would, I would suggest operationally, it's not as uh, efficient and effective with um, face coverings but it's not to say it's an impossibility. So, Stephanie, the police say that facial recognition technology will still work even if the face is partially covered. Is that true? Some facial recognition technology can indeed identify someone just using their eyes alone. That would require infrared capability and depth sensing capability. That exists in your Apple iPhone 10. It does not, to my knowledge, exist in the um, technology that the police are currently using, which is relying on 2D photographs in a database, CCTV and other public cameras, which tend to return quite low quality footage, and even body cams, not at the moment. So this technology is very much under development. It illustrates though that it's possible. Another question that came up a lot was about facial data and GDPR. Now we've seen some private companies building huge databases of facial data. A lot of people want to know how this can be allowed to happen. 
It's a great question. So in the show last week, you featured a company called Facewatch, and Facewatch is maintaining its own watch list of people it thinks are either criminals or suspected criminals, and it's sharing its own privately gathered watch list with the police. And then the police are sharing their database with Facewatch. And the potential loophole within the GDPR is that the GDPR protects people's biometric data, but makes exceptions for things like national security, fighting fraud, and fighting corruption. Stephanie, thank you very much for your insights and thank you so much for your comments and questions. Don't forget you can always get in touch with us on Twitter at BBC Click. So far we've been concentrating on the negative side of facial recognition technology, but of course it can also be used as a force for good. As we mentioned last week, one of the biggest drivers of this emerging technology is China. And one of the companies behind this is Tencent. They use facial recognition for a number of things, including to stop underage game playing. When I visited their HQ in Shenzhen, they took me through another application of the technology they like to shout about, tracking down people, and especially children, who've gone missing. Tencent claims its systems, which are used in a number of its core services, have helped find hundreds of people. On occasions, they've been missing for a number of years, and techniques were developed to account for the changes in facial features over this time. I met up with Ross Liang, who, alongside introducing me to the Tencent mascot, explained how the technique used for locating faces is a bit like shazamming a music track, converting faces to a stream of numbers to look for. If you take a look at this, this is a thermal map of a human face. When you upload a picture that's an image of a human face, for it to be identifiable, it has to identify certain features of a human face. We work with public security to build a database. If anyone spots an elderly person, say, wandering the streets, you can take a photo and upload it, and we can quickly identify the person on this database. People hope that facial recognition is useful for their own purposes. For example, payment. There's no difference between China and the rest of the world. For the public, everyone would be worried if everywhere they go they can be identified. It's a very sensitive thing. Even in China, the public are very sensitive to it. And here in the UK, the latest published data suggests that over 60,000 people under the age of 18 went missing in the space of a year. Now, while 97% of those come home or are found alive and well, the unimaginably heartbreaking search for the remaining 3% continues. And here too, facial recognition could provide an extra bit of hope, as Lara's been finding out. This is six-year-old Bleona Mata. She disappeared from her family home in Albania in 2010. And this is how she might look today at 15. After repeated sightings by Albanians visiting, she's thought to be in the UK. In her home country, hers has been a high-profile case. So, of course, all conventional avenues of searching have been pursued. But now, Amazon's facial recognition software is being tried. It's part of a new system that aims to search the dark web, as well as all websites, to find any pictures that may bear a likeness. The dark web is what could be described as the hidden part of the internet. It provides anonymity to those using it, and policing it is difficult. This engine casts its net wide, searching internationally for a likeness. When it gets a hit or receives a reported sighting, a poster is sent to screens in the vicinity, filling otherwise redundant advertising space. The GMC engine is a very basic platform that allows currently 29 countries, law enforcement agencies and charities um, to upload missing child photos and information. So on social media, on uh, via email or uh, on Twitter. 
Amazon's recognition works by extracting data from the face and representing that as numerical values. So then it'll do the same again with the other images that it's searching for the person in. Here we end up with a percentage possibility as to whether it is that same person. We don't actually store the faces, so we store a numerical representation of the faces. We encode that numerically, and that is a one-way process, so there's no way to return and generate an image of the face from this numerical vector that we store. We have a customer called Marius Analytics in the US that has rescued a 16-year-old girl in Northern California that had been a traffic for sexual exploitation. London in here. Inputting Bleona's picture created no leads on this occasion, but the system will continue to search until it's told to stop. Yet the pain of not knowing still continues for her family. This is early days for the technology, and clearly it can be improved over time. We are looking to connect to other data sets um, you know, child sexual abuse material databases or perpetrator databases, sex offender databases, or even CCTV. If this system has the capacity and it's that easy to input a picture and within seconds it's going to have searched the whole web, why isn't this being done for every single child who's missing? I think the system has the capacity. It's just a matter of capacity in our own team or in policing to make sure that the system is used. At the moment, uh, only our team has access to the GMC engine, um, and so we need to make sure that our team have access to all the images of the outstanding missing children, say after three days, and then run them through the engine to see if we can find them. As is often the case, the technology existing is just the first step. With the ability to search not just the open internet, but also the dark web, this could be the start of something far bigger. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. This week, WhatsApp urged its 1.5 billion users to update the app after finding surveillance software had been remotely installed on some phones. China's OnePlus revealed the OnePlus 7 Pro featuring a pop-up selfie camera and super-fast screen refresh rate. And NASA announced its plans to send the first woman to the moon by 2024 with the Artemis program, named for previous manned mission Apollo's twin sister. Amazon.com is rolling out robots capable of packaging 600 customer orders per hour, according to a report from Reuters. The report says these machines could replace the jobs of up to 1,300 people in Amazon warehouses across America. Amazon said the technology is being piloted with the goal of increasing safety, speeding up delivery times and adding efficiency across its network. President Donald Trump has declared a national emergency to protect U.S. computer networks from foreign adversaries. The president signed an order effectively banning American companies from using foreign telecoms believed to pose national security risks. The order does not name any specific company, but is thought to target Huawei. Meanwhile, Vodafone says it will be using Huawei equipment in its UK 5G network. The UK government says its policy on 5G is being reviewed. And finally, the winners of the Global Learning X Prize have been announced. Two teams tied and will split a $10 million prize. Kit Kat School and One Billion worked with 3,000 children in villages across Tanzania. They developed programs for children to teach themselves basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills. New York's Tribeca Film Festival has just packed up for another year. And while traditional independent cinema is still very much the festival's bread and butter, virtual reality is fast becoming a staple at the event. This year was no exception, with Tribeca's immersive arcades drawing the crowds, all wanting to see what some of the most creative people in VR had come up with, and they certainly didn't disappoint. There's a real variety on show here, from the stop-motion epic Gymnasia, which stars this creepy chap, to experiences that take you back in time thousands of years, or to the front lines of the First World War, and even to this inner city housing estate. When we first started showing things, there was kind of, there, there was kind of a, a list of things that you couldn't do in VR, like you can't move a camera, you can't, there are no cuts. Uh, all of those things have changed, you know, I think all it took was experimentation. Drop in the ocean gives you the chance to ride on a jellyfish from the darkest depths all the way to the surface, discovering a host of life and plastic pollution on the way. And thanks to some new body tracking tech, you can do the whole thing with a friend. 
While for me it wasn't perfect, it did give you a glimpse of a less lonely future for VR. Cinema experiences like these are still one of the few ways for most people to experience really immersive virtual reality, and that's because the current generation of high-end VR headsets can be complicated to set up and expensive. Perhaps this new form factor will help. It feels like it's been the year of VR for about the last five years now. The real question is though, when will VR go mainstream? And is this the experience that's gonna take us there? Okay, so maybe that headset isn't the answer, so this is the Quest. It's the latest headset from Facebook-owned Oculus. And you may notice that there's not a single cable in sight anywhere. Everything is contained in the headset itself, including the tracking that tells it where exactly it is in the room, doing away with the external trackers that older headsets needed. But the Quest is a bit different. It's got these four cameras positioned around the front of the headset that can see the room and figure out exactly where it is, much like we do with our own two eyes. It's a pretty slick piece of kit, and given that you've got a half kilogram blob strapped to your face, it feels pretty good. The built-in speakers are a nice touch, but you'll still want to use good quality headphones if you want nice audio. Ultimately though, inside the Quest is still essentially a very high-end mobile phone, and you can see that in the stripped-back style of many of the experiences and games on offer. At £400, I'm still sceptical that this is going to be the device that makes VR go mainstream. But it's definitely an improvement on what we had before, and I think for some people, it's going to be a lot of fun. Back at Tribeca, creators aren't letting business problems like that cramp their creativity. Big-ticket experiences like these are a crucial part of keeping the VR buzz alive. It's still a very youthful medium, so it's going to take some time for people to really um, adopt it. But what's important at this moment, I think, are location-based experiences so that we do have places like the Tribeca Film Festival that create a launch point for the experiences and also expose audiences to the medium. Better headsets and better experiences can only be a good thing for VR, but the glaring issue for me is still how solitary it all can be. If there is a killer app for VR out there, it'll almost certainly have to solve that problem first. That was Stephen, and back at the Barbican's new exhibition, I'm becoming part of the show. No, this isn't a painting of flowers, but an AI looking at my hand and other objects through a camera. This is a demonstration of how a neural network can only interpret what it sees through a camera based on what you've already taught it. So if you only feed a neural network images of waves, it will try and interpret what it can see through this camera in terms of seascapes. But if, for example, you were to only feed it images of fire, then my hands would be interpreted in terms of flames. Pretty cool, or should I say hot. Constructing images based on what it's seen previously means an AI can often extrapolate minute details of something and dream up visuals that we never would. This bizarre work highlights how a neural network will look for patterns that it recognises, but if it looks too hard, or the sensitivity has turned up too much, it starts to see things that aren't there. It starts imagining or hallucinating. Learning how an AI perceives the world is an undercurrent running throughout the exhibition. And with understanding comes language. This is the waterfall of meaning, and it's examined millions of sentences and looked at the way we use words to try and teach itself whether, for example, beer is expensive or cheap, whether it's bad or good, whether it's male or female. If there's an inherent bias in how we use words, that will show up in the results. AI is just revealed, you know, the secret part of human. So I think, you know, that this is a good opportunity to think about bias, you know, because AI doesn't lie, you know, AI doesn't excuse them. AI just, you know, reveal everything. So, and then that's the reason, you know, the bias getting problem. Actually, we have the problem already. The judgment and ethics of artificial intelligence is under the spotlight here. Taking part in the exhibition is world-renowned AI expert Francesca Rossi. 
She's part of the European Commission's new crack team of AI experts working towards establishing AI ethics guidelines. The focus is on trust. How do we build trust in the technology itself? So what are the properties that are needed of the technology? Is uh, regarding bias, explainability, uh, and so on. And also trust in those that produce the technology. For example, by assuring that they have some level of transparency in how they build the technology. So if you build this the various dimensions of trust, we think that this is the right approach to really get uh, these concerns under control and this will be put us in the best position also to address possibly new concerns that will come with the more advanced and future versions of AI. Okay, let's move on now. The way that we watch football has changed dramatically in the last few years. We can now watch from more angles and on more devices than ever before. But Paul Carter has been checking out a new camera system which could give football fans a totally new perspective on the action. In a previous episode of the show, we saw how the emerging technology of volumetric filming was being used by movie studios to shoot films in a whole new way. This system, developed by Intel, uses a series of cameras to create three-dimensional images of a set, but now it's seeing new applications in the world of sport. I'm here at the Emirates Stadium, home of Arsenal Football Club, the first Premier League team to use a revolutionary new technology that could change the way we watch the beautiful game in the future. As well as Arsenal, the Intel TrueView system has been installed at two other Premier League clubs, Champions League finalists Liverpool and the newly crowned Premier League champions, Manchester City. In the past, a traditionally a camera would show you one point of view. What we can actually do is enable multiple cameras to consist of one frame and one shot that shows you a 360 degree angle, showing you all those plays of, well, did he touch, did he not touch? I'd like to see it from the other side, so now we can deliver that story to you. It consists of 38 5K cameras installed at fixed points around each stadium, which feed content into a dedicated control room. In this control room, an operator and producer can recreate match action in 3D and using some serious processing power can allow replays to simulate the perspective from any point or player on the pitch. Imagine that if you would be filming me now in volumetric, I would not just be a two-dimensional image as people are now experiencing at home, but I'm actually built up of hundreds of thousands of millions of three-dimensional pixels. So what do the clubs get out of it? It starts to merge that space between that passive sports viewing experience that we're all used to and that kind of active esports and gaming experience that people are used to. It has the ability to really um, provide a properly and truly immersive experience for our audience. So um, the ability for them to feel, see, experience what it's like to be Sergio Aguero scoring a goal at the weekend at the Etihad, um, we think is, is a truly compelling proposition. Although clearly in its relative infancy in sport, the potential for this technology is plain to see. With increased connectivity and cloud-based processing, could we see fewer people paying for tickets to attend matches in person? When this stadium is full, this stadium is noisy. You get the smells, you get to spot what the people on the other side are doing, you get to follow the, you get to watch the left back if you want to watch the left back. You know, there is an experience here that you will never be able to convey um, uh, on a TV screen or on, on, a, on a, a tablet or whatever. I think what we're trying to do with things like the Intel tech though, is get that experience as close as possible. That was Tom Hines talking to Paul Carter. This is Alter 3, which is in no way freaking me out. Uh, <laughs> that is it though from AI More Than Human at the Barbican Centre in London. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can. Don't forget we live on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and I'm going to step a little bit further away from this thing. Bye.